Welcome. Hi. Have a seat. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 one scene performances. I will tell father what you did here today. I didn't do it for him. I didn't do it for him. Oh, have I got your attention now? Good. For this list, we're looking at actors who had a major speaking role in a single scene in a film. Be sure to let us know in the comments which single scene performance stole the show for you. All right, let's get into it. Number 20, Andrew Scott, 1917. Three miles deep, field fortifications, defenses, artillery, the like of which we've never seen before. The second are due to attack the line shortly after dawn tomorrow. They have no idea what they're in for. This World War I film follows two ordinary soldiers making their way across war-torn France in an attempt to get a vital message to the front lines. The film casts two relative unknowns in the leading roles to emphasize how the enlisted soldiers felt like everyday people. Conversely, their superiors are played by famous actors, including the likes of Colin Firth and Benedict Cumberbatch, representing how generals and other high-ranking officials were seen as celebrities. I have heard it all before. I'm not going to wait until dusk or for fog. I'm not calling back my men only to send them out there again tomorrow. Not when we've got the bastards on the run. This is their last stand. Of all the iconic actors they come across, however, the one who deserves special recognition is Andrew Scott as the disaffected Lieutenant Leslie, who morbidly mumbles about the ghastly things he's seen in the war. The trap. But you know, there's a medal in it, for sure. Nothing like a scrap of ribbon to cheer up a widow. Number 19, Ted Levine, Shutter Island. There you are. We were wondering when you'd show up. Have a seat. Come on. As the warden of the prison for the mentally disturbed, Ted Levine brings a true sense of menace and foreboding in his short time on screen. He arrives at the perfect moment in this paranoia thriller to further amplify the stakes and further put the main character Teddy, as well as the audience, on edge. Musing on human nature, he manages to give a chillingly bleak speech on how thin the divide between civility and brutal violence is. Because God gave us violence to wage in his honor. I thought God gave us moral order. There's no moral order as pure as this storm. There's no moral order at all. There's just this. Can my violence conquer yours? Impressively, the scene only improves upon a second viewing, as the twist ending reveals further depth to the sinister performance by Levine. Your Carly thinks you're harmless, that you can be controlled, but I know different. You don't know me. Oh, but I do. No, you don't, you don't oh, know I know you. We've known each other for centuries. Number 18, Alfred Molina, Boogie Nights. Once again, this is a scene built on tension. But unlike Levine, Alfred Molina plays a seemingly unhinged drug dealer. Come on in, come on in. Uh, these are my friends here. Hey, hey. come on in, come on in, great to see you. Take a seat, take a seat. You want something to drink? A pill, a little coke, a little dope, I got everything. Molina manages to be jovial yet threatening, dangerous yet funny, and deranged yet in control of the situation in a way that few actors could manage. Wearing his bathrobe, he seems unconcerned by anything as he plays his custom mixtapes and wields a gun while firecrackers are set off in the background. Then, when things go sideways, he drops his friendly persona and amplifies his threatening, deranged attitude. Do not reach for your gun! Don't reach for your gun! The scene serves as the peak of the film's spiral to depravity and insanity, and it's all sold by Molina stealing the scene. Number 17, Matthew McFadden, The Assistant. Welcome. Hi. Have a seat. Over the course of a day, the titular assistant Jane, played by Julia Garner, becomes aware that her boss is using his position of power to harass young female employees. Meanwhile, female managers want to look the other way, while male employees seem amused by it. With nowhere else to turn, Jane speaks to her HR rep. Enter Matthew McFadden as Wilcox. Despite his cool composure and blandness, Wilcox makes it implicitly clear that not only will Jane's accusations go nowhere, if she does speak up, she will destroy her career. I can see that you've got what it takes. 
Thanks. So why are you in here trying to throw it all away over this bullshit? What really makes this even-keeled performance so terrifying is how sinister he manages to be while being boring middle management. I've got 400 resumes teed up for your position alone. Ivy League grads, 4.0 GPAs. And here you are sitting in my office stressed out, jealous of some new assistant who's, who's getting more attention than you. Number 16, Barry Shabaka Henley, Collateral. After a number of murders and near-death scrapes, the hitman Vincent and cab driver Max head to a local jazz club and talk to the proprietor Daniel, played by Henley. It was about being around the music, and I was. Vincent and Daniel bond over their love of jazz, and Daniel tells the story of how he played with Miles Davis, as Henley brings a real sense of warmth to the character. But did you get to talk to him? I'm better than that. No. I played for about 20 minutes. Unbelievable. How'd you do? Do. Well, you really ain't shit when you're playing next to Miles Davis. <laughs> that warmth changes to fear and desperation when he realizes Vincent has been sent to kill him. But he gets one chance to answer a question and live. Daniel answers with such confidence that we know he'll be all right. That is, until Vincent shoots him. His father was a dentist, East St. Louis. Invested in agriculture, made plenty of money. He sent Miles to Juilliard School of Music, New York, 1945. Number 15, Chris Evans, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. No stranger to comic book characters, Evans plays the second of Ramona's evil exes Scott must defeat, Lucas Lee. Oh man, we gotta go. What? Why? I used to date that clown. And action! Oh my god. Hey, the only thing keeping me and her apart are the two minutes it's gonna take to kick your ass. You dated a famous guy? As Lucas, the pretty good skater turned pretty good actor, Evans brought a rare charisma and likability to the cocky antagonist. Can I have your, can I have your autograph, please? What's up? How's life? He seems nice. His sense of swagger and over-the-top bravado makes the performance one that isn't easy to forget, and one that fits in perfectly with the over-the-top world inspired by video games and comics the film presents. Like Scott himself, it's hard for the audience not to get caught up in the charm and fun that Evans brings to the part, despite him actually being a villain. The seven evil exes coming to kill you, controlling the future of Ramona's love life? No. Oh, well, hey, listen, man, don't worry about it. Really? Yeah, let's go get a beer. Let's go. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Number 14, Billy Crystal and Carol Kane, The Princess Bride. We need a miracle. It's very important. Look, I'm retired. Besides, why would you want someone the king's stinking son fired? I might kill whoever you want to meet the miracle. He's already dead. He is, huh? I'll take a look. Bring him in. The Princess Bride is one of the most iconic movies of all time, in large part thanks to its incredible cast of characters. Despite only appearing on screen for about five minutes, Miracle Max and Valerie are no exception. In heavy old age makeup, Crystal played a crotchety old miracle worker partially inspired by his Jewish grandmother. Bringing equally hilarious energy was Carol Kane, playing his bickering wife. Liar! Liar! Get back, witch! I'm not a witch, I'm your wife! But after what you just said, I'm not even sure I want to be dead anymore! You never had it so good. Improvising some of the film's most iconic lines, they turned what could have been essentially a scene that served as a deus ex machina into one of the funniest and most memorable parts of the film. That's a miracle pill. The chocolate coating makes it go down easier, but you have to wait 15 minutes for full potency. And you shouldn't go in swimming after for at least, what? An, an hour. Yeah, an a hour. good hour. Number 13. Dean Stockwell, Blue Velvet. To say that veteran actor Dean Stockwell's performance as the criminal Ben was an unsettling one would be an understatement. Good old friend. This is a fine surprise. You brought your friends my surprises. Please sit down. The off-kilter disturbing character fits perfectly in the neo-noir thriller, alongside the rest of the bizarre characters sprouting from David Lynch's imagination. His over-the-top smile makes his threatening demeanor all the more frightening, as he happily punches people in the gut and reveals himself to be a kidnapper. Did he hurt your little face? <laughs> I feel better. All of this weirdness builds to a lip-synced performance of Roy Orbison's Only in Dreams that manages to send shivers down our spines. 
candy colored clown they call the Sandman. Tiptoes to my room every night. Number 12, Vanessa Redgrave, Atonement. Redgrave doesn't appear until the very last scene of this romantic war film, but her appearance recontextualizes everything we've seen up till that point. Much of the preceding film is told through the lenses of an unreliable narrator, and we finally meet that narrator in the finale. I'm sorry. Could we stop for a moment? Of course. Is, is something the matter? I just need a couple of minutes by myself. An elderly version of a character played by Saoirse Ronan, Redgrave reveals that the happy ending was a fiction invented for her novel. And if that could never have happened. Nothing ever. Because... Robbie Turner died of septicemia at Bray Dunes on June 1st, 1940, the last day of the evacuation. Redgrave plays the character with a real sense of sadness, explaining why she changed the facts. Unlike the rest of the film, which was filled with grand sets and period costumes, this one simply had an actor set against a black background giving a heartbreaking speech. What sense of hope? What satisfaction could a reader derive from an ending like that? So in the book, I wanted to give Robbie and Cecilia what they lost out on in life. Number 11, Gene Hackman, Young Frankenstein. Oh, you must have been the tallest one in your class. <laughs> My name is Harold, and I live here all alone. What is your name? Mm. I didn't get that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nope. While he is perhaps best known for dramatic roles like The French Connection, Hackman has some impressive comedic acting chops as well, which he gets to show off in his small but memorable role in this Mel Brooks masterpiece. As a blind man, Hackman prays for a companion, prayer that is quickly answered when Frankenstein's monster arrives. A visitor is all I ask. A temporary companion to help me pass a few short hours in my lonely life. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Sorry, Frankenstein. The film takes full advantage of Hackman's mastery of physical comedy and his deadpan line delivery by having him unknowingly unleash a string of terrors upon the hapless monster before he flees, once again leaving the sad priest alone. Wait! Where are you going? I was gonna make espresso. Number 10, William Hurt, A History of Violence. After spending much of the film chased by goons, former hitman Joey, played by Viggo Mortensen, finally departs from his family to face his old life. We're here. Home sweet home. That old life is embodied by his brother Richie, with Hurt bringing a restrained fury to the role as a mobster whose sense of vengeance will only be satisfied with blood. Hurt manages to do so much with so little in this climactic scene, both in terms of restrained emoting and having such little screen time. I'm pretty pissed at you, Brian. You could have called. You could have dropped a postcard in the mail. We're brothers. What'd you think would happen? Despite only appearing in the film for about eight minutes, Hurt received a nomination for Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars. You could do something, I guess. You could die, Joey. Number 9. Ned Beatty, Network Like Hurt, this very short performance by Ned Beatty was good enough to get him an Oscar nomination in a film that has proved to be one of the most prescient of all time. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it! Is that clear? This, of course, included its predictions of reality TV, sensationalized news, and the near worship of capitalist values. The values of corporate America are delivered in the form of Arthur Jensen, played by Beatty, who manages to make his truly terrifying ideals sound downright appealing in a speech he gives to the unraveling Howard Beale. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide, and Exxon. Beatty manages to become the embodiment of corporate greed that would convince the common people to act against their own interests. One vast and ecumenical holding company for whom all men will work to serve a common profit. 
in which all men will hold a share of stock. All necessities provided. All anxieties. Number eight, Gloria Foster, The Matrix. You're the Oracle? Bingo. Not quite what you were expecting, right? One of the key themes in The Matrix is free will versus determinism, and that theme is personified in the Oracle. Despite appearing in only a single scene near the film's midpoint, the Oracle's presence was felt throughout, with anticipation building to Neo meeting her in the first half and their conversation driving the events of the second half. You're going to have to make a choice. In the one hand, you'll have Morpheus's life. And in the other hand, you'll have your own. One of you is going to die. Foster had to portray a mysterious and unknowable yet completely familiar grandmotherly figure, all while doling out a lot of exposition and moving the plot forward. Yet she made this balancing act seem easy, absolutely charming the audience, and making us wonder if Neo would have broken that vase if she hadn't said anything. You're in control of your own life. Remember? Here. Take a cookie. Number seven, Viola Davis, Doubt. While she was already an award-winning stage actor, Viola Davis was a relative unknown in the film world when she appeared in a single scene in Doubt. And that would mean an opportunity at college. I don't see anything at this time standing in the way of his graduating with his class. Well, that's all I care about. I doubt that. Her role as the mother of a boy likely harmed got her a number of accolades, including an Oscar nomination. That Father Flynn may have made advances on your son. May have made. I can't be certain. No evidence? No. And maybe there's nothing to it. Her character is an astoundingly complex one, seeking to turn a blind eye to what possibly may have been done to her son in order to protect him from further harm in the long run, at least in her eyes. Today, Viola Davis is a household name thanks to her devastating and multifaceted performance in Doubt. I'm talking about the boy's nature now. Not anything he's done. You can't hold a child responsible for what God gave him to be. Number six, Dave Bautista, Blade Runner 2049. I was careful not to drag in any dirt. I don't mind the dirt. I do mind an announced visit. You police. A wrestler and mixed martial artist, Batista became well-known to wider audiences when he became famous for playing tough guys and comic relief characters in films like Spectre and Guardians of the Galaxy, respectively. However, Batista showed the true depths of his acting talent when he showed up in Denis Villeneuve's Blade Runner sequel. Must have been brutal. Plan on taking me in. Well, take a look inside. Mr. Morton. If taking you in is an option. Soft-spoken and kindly, yet also imposing and intense, in just a few minutes, Batista manages to portray a physically imposing man with tragic eyes hidden behind those tiny glasses, playing off the equally stoic character played by Ryan Gosling. Batista embodies a man who has known death is just around the corner for years and is finally facing it. Because you've never seen a miracle. Number five, Steve Park, Fargo. The Coen Brothers films are more often than not filled with weird and interesting people that might feel like someone you could actually know. The inhabitants of Fargo, Minnesota are no exception. And Steve Park's brief appearance as Mike Yanagita proves that point. March? <laughs> oh, jeez! Oh, you look great! Yeah, so do you. Oh, easy there, easy there. Mike reconnects with his high school crush Marge, and comes off as the classic nice guy trying just a little too hard and gets a bit too familiar. Well, uh, I was married. Uh, I, I was married to... You mind if I sit over here? Uh, I was married to Linda Cooksey. No, why don't you sit over there? I prefer that. 
It doesn't take long for him to break down crying about his loneliness, giving a performance that's both pathetic and tragic. You were such a super lady. And then, I did so lonely. It's okay, Mike. Number four, Drew Barrymore, Scream. Hello. Hello. Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? What number is this? What number are you trying to reach? I don't know. By the mid-90s, horror films had become stale, as an oversaturation of similarly structured slashers in the previous two decades had taught audiences all the tropes and cliches. No one knows that better than Wes Craven, creator of the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh-huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. With his film Scream, he used moviegoers' meta-knowledge of slasher tropes against them. When 90s darling Drew Barrymore appeared at the beginning of the film, it seemed to set up that she would be the final girl in the mold of Laurie Strode. Audiences at the time were fooled when, during the stirring opening scene, Barrymore was immediately killed off. <laughs> Number 3. Matthew McConaughey, The Wolf of Wall Street. Jordan Belfort, as played by Leonardo DiCaprio, embodied the greed, vanity, and lust of Wall Street. See, money doesn't just buy you a better life, better food, better cars, better It also makes you a better person. While Leo had three hours to portray the dangers of excessive drugs, prostitutes, and lavish spending, Matthew McConaughey had only a few minutes to do the same. McConaughey plays Belfort's mentor and boss, Mark Hanna, who, in a simple dinner conversation, molds the bright-eyed optimist Belfort into the despicable person he becomes. Done! Time to paint the tape. Woo! Oh, 2000 Microsoft going in the hole! Come on! Hannah, above all, is a salesman, and he successfully sells the self-indulgent gospel of depravity in an enthusiastic, chest-thumping rant. <laughs> Number two, Alec Baldwin, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Oh, have I got your attention now? Good. Occasionally, a single line or phrase from a movie becomes so iconic or popular that it eclipses the movie itself in popular culture. Alec Baldwin shouting ABC always be closing is exactly that for this film. A, B, C. A always B, B, C closing. Always be closing. He delivers the tirade, which also includes the famous line, coffees for closers. And his rant is what this excellent film is still best known for, as it captures the do-or-die attitude of sales in the 80s and 90s. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Perhaps the most impressive thing is that the scene didn't even appear in the David Mamet play the film is based on. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass balls to sell real estate. Go and do likewise, gents. I have to tell you, I am personally partial to the Gene Hackman scene in Young Frankenstein because for some reason, my family and I are always quoting it to each other. Anyway, obviously we had to pick someone else for number one, and I have to tell you, it's pretty impressive that they were above that memorable Alec Baldwin scene. Do you think you know who it is? Well, let's get through the honorable mentions and then we'll see if you're right. Martin Scorsese, Taxi Driver, an unhinged director's cameo. Did I tell you to do that with the meter? Put the meter back, let the numbers go on. I don't care what I have to pay. I didn't say I'm not getting out. Put the meter back on. Put it down. Put it, that's right. Put it, put, put it down. Taika Waititi, Hunt for the Wilder People. Hilarious and off the wall eulogy. And through the first door. Oh, it's easy to get through that door and on the other side, waiting for you are all the nummiest treats you can imagine. Fanta, Doritos, LMP, Burger Rings, Coke Zero. Charles Fleischer, Zodiac a goosebump-inducing paranoia scene. It's not a problem. They're just down in the basement. Not many people have basements in California. I 
do. James Badge Dale, Flight, gives a philosophical speech as a cancer patient. Once you realize that all the random events in your life are God, you will live a much easier life. We spend all our time trying to control all these things that happen to us. It's bullshit. Donnie Wahlberg, The Sixth Sense, lost or reported 43 pounds to place someone physically and mentally broken. Do you know why you're afraid when you're alone? I do. I do. <laughs> what do you want? What he promised me! What would he promise me? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Christopher Walken, Pulp Fiction. This watch I got here was first purchased by your great-grandfather during the First World War. It was bought in a little general store in Knoxville, Tennessee. There are a number of one-scene wonders from Tarantino films, including Julia Butters in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But Christopher Walken's soliloquy as Captain Coons stands apart. In a flashback, he tells the young Butch about a family heirloom that has made its way from his great-grandfather, who wore it in the First World War, to his grandfather, who wore it in the Second, and finally to his father, who died keeping it safe in the Vietnam War, so he could give it to Butch. This watch was on your daddy's wrist when he was shot down over that. Hanoi. It was captured put in a Vietnamese prison camp. Walken tells of how he and Butch's father kept it hidden for years as POWs, and gives a performance that alternates between moving, tragic, and downright hilarious. Then, after seven years, I was sent home to my family, and now, little man, I give the watch to you. So, do you agree? Can you think of any other epic one-scene movie performances? Be sure to let us know about it in the comments, or come tell me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton, or on my YouTube channel. See ya! Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.